season so far. Oh, really? Stress. Are you stressed? I can't really handle this. I'm stressed. How do we do it? <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to another episode. Um, this is John Lemansky with Biohack MD. I'm here with my good friend Dave Krasunski with Heads Up Health. What's going on, Dave? Another great day here in Tahoe. Yeah, so we're here in Tahoe. We're going to be talking a little bit uh, about cold water exposure today and uh, some of the health benefits associated with it and some of the research behind it. So I convinced Dave to jump in Lake Tahoe, which is uh, 48 degrees uh, right now. I hate cold. I have no, I no idea yeah. why I agreed to this, but I am about to jump into 40 degree water. The things we do for Just science. because my buddy John asked me to do it. Yep. But other than that, I hate the cold. So I'll probably be uh, jumping out after about two seconds. Probably. We'll see how it goes. Probably. I'm on camera, so I'm going to have to tough it out a little longer. Well, we'll do a time lapse, and it seems like a lot longer than it makes me look good. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we want to talk a little bit about uh, cold water exposure, different ways to do it, some of the historical perspective and, and why it's so important as part of your biohacking repertoire, and specifically when you're in ketosis, why it's beneficial. So um, why don't we start a little bit about historically why yep. cold water exposure was so important. Yeah, we talked about this. It's mm -hmm. been used for thousands of years. Thousands of years, yeah. Now seeing a resurgence in the biohacking community, right. we actually now we're talking about we have ways to measure it, which didn't exist before. Right. But what's the history that we can Yeah, I mean you can here? you can go back thousands of years, like you mentioned. The Romans were one of the first ones that you can actually see documentation of them. And they called it frigidaire baths, which basically is, you know, cold water uh, immersion. And it seems like the more that biohacking is becoming into the mainstream, the more we're realizing that a lot of previous cultures actually did all this stuff. Yep. They didn't call it biohacking. They didn't know the actual data behind it, but they knew that it made them feel better and improved health. And so now with all the science that we have to actually look at why this works, we're able to come back full circle, actually measure why um, you know, cold Red water exposure right here. is important. And there's a lot of studies now coming out on, you know, obviously rodent models, but some human models that are actually showing tremendous amount of benefit for us. Yep. So I think we kind of delve into that. Also, you know, the Nordic people have a long history of basically using cold water exposure. In the winter times, they would break through the ice, jump in. Yep. And you know, most of the craziest people I know now are still doing it out in the, the Nordic countries. Yeah, I, I, I grew up in a small town up in central Canada and was back there this winter and they have yep. a Nordic spa that opened up yeah, in, you were telling in me Winnipeg and it's 40 degrees outside. And the way they do it there is you'll actually go into a wet or a dry sauna, mm -hmm. build up the heat in the body, yep. and then go into the cold plunge, and then follow that with a state of relaxation. Right. And just keep repeating that. And it just does a lot in terms of neurotransmitter regulation, all kinds of other physiological benefits that actually have an incredibly relaxing effect on the body. You go through that Absolutely. cycle a few times and you're just completely relaxed. And that bears out in a lot of the studies here. So. That's how the my Nordic experience up in Canada, that's how they were implementing this modality. Hot, cold, right. rest. rest. So I will tell you, this is not going to be as uh, sauna or spa-esque as uh, your Well, we got, a, we got an 80 degree day here. Yep. We've got some cold water, yep. so we'll, we'll get close we'll to be replicating. Good. Yeah. It'll be good. But, and we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, what, uh, physiologically, why it's important to do it that way. Yep. But basically, concept, you know, sauna, you increase your blood flow, you dilate the blood vessels, you increase the surface area of the blood. And so when you jump into the cold water, now you have that much more surface area. Cool. Plus it seems like that degree of separation from very hot to very cold causes an even more of a hormetic response. And hormesis is something that you and I will be talking about, but it's a, this idea that a little bit of stressors at a time, your body actually responds very well to that and it, it adapts. So an example would be weight training. If you do you know, hardcore weight training, HIIT training, 
that's a hormesis. Your body responds okay. by increasing growth hormone, testosterone, nor nice. norepinephrine. But let's say you know you have chronic stress, which is what we're seeing in Western society, that changes the ball game, and we want to get back to a balance. And, and the reality is that our lifestyle is hard to have that balance. So a technique that's been around for ages. Yep. And now we're going to talk about how to quantify it. Right. And how it works physiologically in the body. Correct. Cool. So kind of pathophysiologically, let's go back and see, okay, what is the importance? What is actually happening when you jump in cold water? Okay. So there's a couple of things that you have to think about. One is the degree of the cold water. Mm -hmm. So if you jump in 75 degree water, not much is going to happen. You can spend an hour in 70 degree water and you're really not going to get a tremendous amount of benefits. Now, if you drop the temperature to like, you know, 50s, 40s, you can decrease the amount of time that you're in there. And that's part of what's happening with cryotherapy is they're decreasing that temperature to extremes and they're, you know, shorting the amount of time that you actually have to be exposed and trying to get some of the same benefits. And they're actually, well, the, if it's done properly at a cryo facility, yeah. they're actually making sure that there's a temperature change, right. sufficient temperature change right. by measuring skin surface to ensure that you're getting the physiological benefits. Correct, yeah. And there's a couple ways that they do that. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the different modalities and why one is better than the other or um, kind of the effects of each one. Well, we'll get to the different ways yeah. to do it, but keep going on the, the what, how it works. Yeah, and, and so again, with, with everything with the body, your body tries to maintain a very narrow range of um, you know temperature, pH balance, autonomic system control. So as far as temperature goes, it's quite hard to drop your body temperature down, like the core temperature. Your body does everything possible to avoid that. It constricts blood vessels, it shunts the blood to the organs that need it the most. So in order to really get the thermogenesis benefit that you're looking for, you gotta really drop your body temperature by at least down to 96.5 or below. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of hard to do. So when you jump in cold water, you go into cryo, you go into an ice bath, what happens? Well, you get an increase in norepinephrine. And that's really, you know, obviously a neurotransmitter. neurotransmitter, but it's also a hormone that is one of the predominant hormones for your sympathetic nervous system. So it's activating the sympathetic nervous system yeah. first, Correct. which is the stressor. Correct. But it's again this idea of hormesis, so it's a short burst, exactly. and you get a norepinephrine release, and depending on how long you're in the water and at what degree, you either get like up to a two to three hundred fold increase. Uh, excuse me, two to three hundred percent increase, or you can get up to like a five hundred percent increase um, if you do, you know, extended ice bath at um, you know very cold temperatures. When you have that, that norepinephrine does a couple things. So, and we'll talk about this later, but it increases your brown adipose tissue production, yep. which is very important. Something called cold thermogenesis. But you also get increase in growth hormone, mm -hmm. and you get increase in testosterone, which is what you want. And a lot of that has to do with you know, you know building up your, your core muscle tissue um, and regenerating yourself. So the stressor yeah. is something that we can adapt to. Right. The, the first few times you're doing this, it's very unpleasant for people. Most mm -hmm. individuals would, would, would probably, there's much, things they'd much rather be doing than exposing themselves to freezing cold. Right. But it doesn't take long before your body starts to adapt to the therapy and actually it, 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 may, it starts to become something that you can actually really start to enjoy right. rather than being something that could be extremely uncomfortable. So there's an adaptation yeah. response. Just the first few times I would imagine are the most challenging, like any stressor. Yeah. And then your body starts to adapt to experiencing the cold more often. <laughs> Hopefully. I don't know. Well, you've done this more know. than me, man. So I've you tell it, me. I've done it a few times, and I can tell you, uh, I still have an idea. Are we going <laughs> to run out, turn in the opposite direction and run out of this <laughs> water screaming, or what? You might, but I don't know. All right. Well, well you know, unless you're like Wim Hof, who's been doing it for, you know, 30 years and does yeah. it every day. Yeah, no, you do get an adaptation. It takes a while. Yep. It's still cold. It's cold. When you jump in, it's pretty brutal. But but you get used to. I think a lot of what um, people have a hard time with biohacking is that you don't know what to expect, and so there's this element of surprise and concern that you don't know what you're going to get yourself into. Yeah. Which I'm sure you're, you're feeling right now. That's kind of what I was yeah. thinking when I agreed yeah. to this. So yeah. we'll see what happens. That's why that's why text message is the best. Yeah. Um, 
but you you get used to knowing what to expect sure and that makes it a lot easier yeah. and after a while yeah you do adapt to it so I'm just joking with you when I jump in now you know I know what to expect I can tolerate a lot longer and it's something that you build up to you don't jump in the first day in you know 20 degree water and spend an hour you know you have to be smart about it you build up to it which is something we can talk about down the road so cold thermogenesis yeah. you're telling me I'm gonna lose fat when I jump in the freezing cold water yes, sounds sir. counterintuitive how does that work yeah great question so there's a couple of things that happen when you do cold thermogenesis and basically it's this idea of activating your body to produce more energy so if you think about it you can break it down into two separate ways so one is called um, shivering basically yep. uh, thermogenesis so anybody who's been in coal for a while you know comes out shivering yep. what is that actually happening your your muscles are actually making and utilizing more ATP and ATP is the energy that we use for everything and so that activation is actually making the muscles contract very quickly and the reason that happens is because you're trying to create more energy so the heat. shivering is the muscles contracting. Right, to generate more heat to get your body temperature up. Probably a favorable response if we're just mm -hmm. out lost and cold. It's, right. it's a survival adaptation. It is. But now we can use it as a hack. Correct. With controlled exposure for burning fat. And one thing that as a physician we look at is if you've ever taken care of somebody who has hypothermia, they'll start shivering initially. Yep. And at some point they stop shivering. When that happens, you know they're in a danger zone because their body cannot make any more ATP to bring the heat up. I'm you know, glad I'm doing this with you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I, I stop always, shivering, Doc, I can you got my back, right? You. Yeah, I got you. I'll resuscitate you. Um, but it's important because before we talked about, you know, this idea of your body is very regulated in terms of temperature. And that is very true. And the way that it tries to keep the temperature up, the core temperature up, is by shivering. So that's a very important uh, component. It's also important to know that the mitochondria that is generating this ATP, so mitochondria, think of it as your battery within each cell, it is trying to make as much heat as possible using ATP, but it's not 100% efficient. So some of that heat is actually lost, and that is good because you want that heat to start yep. increasing your body temperature. Yep. So then there's the non-shivering component of cold thermogenesis, and this goes back to a little bit of what we talked about before with norepinephrine. Yep. If you think of your mitochondria as a battery, which you can, you have a polarity. So any, any battery has a polarity. You have a negative component and you have a positive component. And it's that shift in ions that actually generate uh, electricity or power. In the cell, it's no different. The inside of the cell is very negatively charged and the outside is very positively charged. And the cell uses that gradient in order to do all its functions. When you jump in cold water like that, you do something called decoupling. And the reason that that happens is because you generate something called UCP1, which is a protein that actually decouples the electron transport chain. So if you actually look at generation of ATP through the mitochondria, it's not just one reaction, it's actually a cascade of reactions. And through that you generate electrons. When that happens, your body wants to recouple, and so it uses a lot of energy in order to try to get that gradient to come back. Restore equilibrium. Exactly. And that is also part of the contribution of making this brown adipose tissue, which people talk about, or BAT, which is this type of fat that is very different from visceral fat, it's very different from subcutaneous fat, in that it generates heat as a byproduct of its um, function. And we can use that to our advantage because why can a guy like Wim Hof go up and climb to the base camp of Everest in shorts? Why can he do that? Anybody else who just jumped in to the base camp with shorts and uh, shoes would get hypothermia and would get frostbite. He can do that because he's trained his body to make more of this brown adipose tissue and by doing that he actually is able to create more energy and not uh, be hypothermic. So visceral adipose tissues, subcutaneous, these, these are inflammatory tissues in some cases but the one yeah. you're talking about is actually a favorable adaptation. Correct, Correct. And, and so when you're born, babies have brown adipose tissue. It's how they maintain their body temperature because yeah. they don't know any better. They, they don't put on a sweater. So they have to have this adaptive mechanism. As you get older, we've always thought that that brown adipose tissue goes away. And in a sense it does because we are always in a controlled environment. Absolutely. We don't go and do hormesis. We yeah. don't jump in the water unless you're crazy like us. Yeah. More people are starting to do it because they see the Borderline benefit. crazy. Well, I'm certifiable crazy. <laughs> you might be borderline, but um, speak for yourself. So the more that we're learning about the benefits, 
the more people are going to realize, okay, I can maintain my brown adipose tissue yep. and get the benefits from that. Awesome. And so that is something that we would like to show. Yeah, this is important, helping yeah. you understand why you want to do this, what yeah. are the physiological benefits that right. you're going to get as you start to expose yourself. We're going to cover how you can quantify this later. Correct. But understanding this biological process is important in terms of how it can help us produce this favorable type of fat Absolutely. adaptation. Yeah, and we're just hitting the surface. Yep. One of the things that's really cool, and we've talked about this before, is that we are at a time where because we can quantify things, because we can do research on things, and because there's interest in it, yeah. people are realizing the absolute benefits to their health from doing all this stuff. Yeah, so John, we covered a lot of the physiological benefits about the way this works. We talked a lot about inflammation, yep. about fat burning. Anecdotally, I know that a lot of professional athletes after a football game, a competitive sport, will soak an ice bath. Mm -hmm. So who should use it in terms of just general healthy people, also, which chronic conditions would respond most favorably? Yeah. And then most equally important is who shouldn't be doing this okay. and why? Yeah, and I think we start off with who shouldn't because I think that is something that a lot of times is missed. So basically, pregnant, anybody who's pregnant should essentially never do this, yeah. okay? Um, the risk involved relative to the benefit are just not worth it. And that kind of goes with everything biohacking in terms of pregnancy. You yeah. want to avoid most of this. Um, anybody who has heart condition, so either cardiovascular disease or dilated cardiomyopathy, should not do this. And um, the reason for that is, if you look at the heart, the blood supply to the heart is fixed. What does that mean? So everywhere else in your body, you can increase the amount of blood flow to it, except the heart. Mm -hmm. And that's very important, so that's why people who get like chest pain when they exercise, who have something called unstable angina, it's because the demand on the heart is more then the actual blood supply is able to be given to the heart. Okay, so that's very important. So anybody who's got heart issues should not, not do this at all. Now let's look at who would benefit from it. So obviously you and I are regular guys, right? I'm thinking about this in terms of the longevity. Yep. Also trying to make sure that my muscle soreness goes down, sure. my inflammation levels go down. So let's talk about inflammation. So inflammation is something that you hear a lot about out in just kind of functional medicine, but wellness and health. Inflammation is good. So inflammation is a necessity. You break your ankle, you want an inflammatory response. That's how you heal. You know, you get sick, you want that inflammatory response. But what happens is that we are chronically exposed to in inflammatory processes. So we're always chronically stops. inflamed. Yeah, exactly. From our food supply to our air sources, to our water, to our daily lives, our stressful lives. Like here, we're very, very stressed. Very difficult. We're increasing our yeah. inflammatory I, markers, I, I, right? I need a vacation after you, Are you stressed? Yeah. Yes. Very difficult. So, so we want to kind of get that under control. And cold water therapy, cold thermogenesis, has a very important uh, component in decreasing overall inflammation. So any, any inflammatory, level. any conditions yep. related to chronic inflammation, Correct. would that include autoimmune disease? Autoimmune diseases, exactly. So it's been shown in studies that when you do these kind of cold water immersions, obviously you can't just do it once and expect to get a huge response. But yep. if you incorporate it into your biohacking lifestyle and you do three to four times a day, you know, at least five minutes at a time, you decrease something called TNF-alpha. Mm -hmm. okay? And that's one of the most major um, cytokines, basically, that control inflammation. Yep. And again, you need that, but you don't want it to be overexpressed. So, so you repeated decrease cold that. exposure can reduce You reduce that, TNF correct. You also get something called um, mitogenesis and autophagy, which we've kind of talked about before. So autophagy is basically kind of the, the hoover of um, the, the, mute, the body. Basically, you're able to get rid of all the old cells, get rid of all the junk, the keeping protein, all the dead cells, yep. get rid of them and make new ones. Similar to fasting? Correct, similar to fasting. And now if you combine the two together, I mean, it's like a supercharge. And then layer on some keto and Yeah, some and if things. you do that while you're in ketosis, you're also getting a supercharge effect because when we talk about inflammation, you get something called reactive oxygen species. Any chemical process, the end product usually will get CO2, which you breathe off. And then you're going to get reactive oxygen species where actually they're going to modulate the inflammatory response. By doing cold water immersion, you actually decrease the amount of production. The other thing that happens is your immune system gets stronger. So you get a more diverse immune system, yep. you get better T cells, which are a, a part of the immune system that really attacks mostly viruses. So you get a more diverse immune system and it's uh, something called 
immunosenescence, which is basically this production of new immune cells that are ready to go. So if you get a cold, it's going to attack it. If you get a bacteria, it's going to attack it much more effectively. And then you get something called mitogenesis, which is basically you make new mitochondria. They're better, there are more of them, and they're stronger, and they produce more energy for you. Cool. So what about from a metabolic point of view? What about someone who's working with a metabolic yep. disorder, whether it's insulin resistance mm -hmm. or diabetic types of conditions right. or other conditions related to a deranged metabolic system? Yeah. So if you think about it in terms of chronic illnesses like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, what happens is you get a chronic elevation of cortisol level, mm -hmm. chronic elevation in norepinephrine, and then you get a chronic elevation in insulin. So cold water immersion has been shown to actually increase insulin sensitivity in the muscles, awesome. which makes sense because you actually need insulin to shunt glucose into the muscles in these receptors called GLUT4 receptors. So you get more of them, insulin becomes more sensitive, and you drive all that sugar into the muscles. So you decrease your fasting glucose, yep. which is something that any diabetic is searching for. Yep. Right? Now, if you do it while you're in ketosis, it's even more beneficial because you decrease your amount of insulin production, you decrease the amount of glucose spikes, so you get better glucose sensitivity and better insulin sensitivity. We've talked a lot about being in ketosis on our last segment, mm -hmm. how you can measure it. I think it's starting to become very commonplace now, so it seems like combining it with yep. cold immersion is an even more powerful combination. It is, awesome. because you, know, you get less reactive oxygen species from using ketones as your energy source versus glucose. Clean or burning. You get more ATP production, yep. and then you can use that ATP production to actually do cold thermogenesis. Cool. So, so autoimmune, inflammatory, athletic recovery yeah. purposes, any other core conditions or use cases that you think respond most favorably here? Well, I think it's important to talk about exercise, because when you think about exercise, there's a couple things to think about. People think that if you, let's say, go, and go for a run and you jump right into an ice bath, that that's going to help decrease inflammation mm -hmm. and help with recovery. And in a way, that's kind of inaccurate. What you want to do is actually get the growth hormone and testosterone boost that you get from exercise. So if you delay it by about an hour and then you jump in to like a leg or an ice bath, then you really get the benefit okay. of the cold water immersion. Great. Okay. Now, when you're talking about endurance athletes, they tend to get some of the most benefits from this. And it's been shown that you can increase the amount of power output by about 25%. You can increase the, your duration of exercise and your recovery, obviously, which makes sense. Probably reduce wear and tear, too, that it yeah. comes with endurance. Right. Sports. And because you want that some inflammatory response, but you don't want it to be excessive. So you yep. want to have the growth hormone, testosterone boost, yep. and then you want to basically shut it down cool. and get the recovery. Cool. And if you've ever done it before after a hard workout, your joints, your muscles, you know, as you get older, like me, not you, but me, getting there. you start feeling it, yeah. right? So if you go out for a ski session or you go out for a mountain biking session, everything hurts, jump in an ice bath, you feel amazing. Well, we'll be doing the mountain bike session later yeah. this summer, so we will follow it up. We will. With a jump in the lake. <laughs> Pace yourself. Yeah, all right. Pace yourself. Let's do one and let's see if you come back. Well, cool. thanks for the breakdown on like, which conditions are most right. beneficial, yep. who shouldn't be using this, etc. Yep. So amazing breakdown how all this works, yep. the physiological benefits, who should be using this, who shouldn't. One of the exciting parts now is the advances in technology mm -hmm. that are available to everyday consumers. Right. All the stuff that you and I have been talking about. And so, how can you actually start to measure for yourself if this is working? You're starting to spend money on cryotherapy sessions, right. not cheap. You're starting to do these crazy plunges in cold water, questioning your sanity. <laughs> what you really want to know is, is this, is this actually working? Am I getting healthier? And there's a lot of ways we can measure this at home. Right. So we've got some of the technology here that people can use. HRV, blood pressure, sleep quality. Yep. What should I be looking for as I introduce this into my routine to know if this is working for me or not? I think that's the most important part right. is seeing it for yourself. Right. It's motivational. It's encouraging. To just to help you optimize? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the more that you kind of delve into biohacking, the more you realize that it's not one thing that actually is going to benefit you. Sure. So it's, it's getting something, adding it to your repertoire, and looking at certain parameters, like you mentioned. So HRV. 
So we talked about HRV a little bit before where, and I, I know you had a very good podcast with uh, Jason Moore um, with uh, Elite HRV talking about how to quantify HRV. So you should see your HRV go up. So okay. this is the standard chest yeah. strap anyone can use, any right. Bluetooth stra chest strap. You and I use Elite HRV, but there's other apps out there. Correct. So you could actually start to measure your heart rate variability on a daily basis right. and start to correlate how it responds as you introduce cold immersion. So Correct. simple Bluetooth chest strap. There's also the Aura Ring that yep. does some HRV type stuff. So yep. easy ones to measure to start to see if those numbers increase. Correct. Cool. So HRV from a you know morning standpoint, the Aura Ring I think is one of the better ones. Lead HRV, you can do uh, early morning point in time measurements. Exactly, as well. you can do it as you go throughout the day and see if there's a change. Blood pressure is one of the best kind of simplest uh, techniques that you can use, right? Yeah, this study actually yeah. referenced significant improvements in blood pressure from right. cold immersion. And then part of that has to do with the elasticity of the blood vessels. So you get some nitric oxide production when you do cold water immersion. Nitric oxide, if anybody's familiar with Viagra. It's how it works. It basically increases the blood flow, dilates the blood vessels. Yep. Same thing happens with this. When you dilate the blood vessels, your blood pressure drops. And I expect an improvement <laughs> in, in, in libido slash sexual performance with cold immersion. Jump in the water with your girlfriend and see what happens. Fair enough. That's the best once way you to get, test it. <laughs> once you get past the yeah. shrinkage part, I think you'll get some benefit. All right. Okay. So what else can you look at? Sleep. So we talked a lot about sleep. You know, like if, if I had to focus on one thing after nutrition, for me, it would be sleep. Absolutely. So dropping your body temperature a little bit before you go to bed, great way to improve sleep outcome, especially hitting deep sleep and REM sleep. Yep. So you can measure that with the Aura Ring or other uh, tracking devices. Cool. So and you then, could expect to see perhaps some improvements in deep yeah. sleep, REM sleep. Absolutely. As you start to do cold immersion. Absolutely. Awesome. And then things like fasting glucose. Yep. So we talked a little bit earlier about how this improves glucose sensitivity, insulin sensitivity. If you measure your fasting glucose in the morning, you'll see it's going to drop down. Makes sense because your muscles are using that glucose to generate heat, right? So another tool we have mm -hmm. to lower fasting glucose. Exactly. In addition to a lot of the stuff we talk about with low-carb keto. Exactly. Another way we can lower those numbers. Right. Cool. You can drop your insulin too. Yep. And then, insulin and then you can, can look at. exactly, and then you know, obviously, fasting ketone levels, you should see an increase. And what about body composition? We talked about yep. the way that brown fat actually helps right. with metabolic response in terms of uh, improving the way we, we, we can burn fat. So, right. would you expect if you were tracking, for example, lean mass, fat mass, mm -hmm. as you go on to a program like this, would you start to look for changes there as well? You will, in terms of actually quantifying the amount of brown adipose tissue it's going to be hard to do that with what we have what about yeah. just like but you can mass, look at mass, dexa yeah. scan type stuff so what you really want to get rid of is the visceral fat yeah. you know people obviously don't like which just is organ fat organ right fat. in here right that is highly inflammatory yeah it's the metabolically active um, fat that actually if you actually look at people sometimes you'll see like that big beer belly but skinny everywhere else that fat is actually squeezing on your organs and it's creating a whole bunch of pro-inflammatory cytokines and that's really the dangerous fat. Yep. And so what you can do is like you mentioned DEXA scan, you can do a body impedance analysis and you can measure the quantity and what you'll see is that as you do this obviously making sure that your nutrition is, is dialed Lots in. Lots of variables but all this your can other, help but as let's say, equation. Yeah, assume that everything is dialed in and you're going to add this to your repertoire. You will see decrease in adipose tissue, specifically visceral fat. Cool. You, you know, if you do it long enough and, and frequently enough, yeah, you'll see subcutaneous uh, fat go away as well. Yeah. Um, but that's not as important. Yeah, as I know the only the only technique I've seen that can actually start to quantify visceral adipose mm -hmm. tissue is a DEXA scan, and they have a way of deducing changes in visceral yeah. adipose tissue. But if if not, you can just use other body composition mm -hmm. metrics. They're if you're seeing fat mass go yeah. down, lean mass go up you can infer that you're also starting to reduce some of the inflammatory fats Absolutely. as well. Simple as test, belt buckle test. You'll see your belt buckle, you go down a notch. Yep. That's simple. You can obviously use, you know, total body weight, which your, I don't your, like. your favorite pair of pants, you know, there's always they that pair of pants that you used yep. to be able to fit into. <laughs> Those are yeah. probably one of the best tools That's we right. have with all this fancy technology is just, That's right. can you get that pair of pants on? Can, can as, you get those, uh, those velvet uh, 1970s pants on, those retro pants? If you can, you're doing well. No, but other things like, you know, if you're in a research study, uh, setting, you can do MRIs, you can do PET scans to yep. look at 
you know, fatty liver disease, you can look at the visceral fat. But in terms of like realistically how you and I, average Joe on the street, gonna be able to quantify this, yeah, you can look at your belt buckle, you can look at, you know, just simple pinch tests. You yeah. know, those are very, Calipers. they can be accurate yeah. if you know how you're doing it. DEXA scan, body penis analysis, tremendous amount of information. Cool. So that's so a lots good of ways to, to quantify it. That's probably the most exciting and motivational so. part is when you can start to see sleep yeah. improving, blood pressure coming down, yeah. and quantifying it for yourself with instrumentation that's available. Mm -hmm. That's the most exciting part is, is yeah. seeing the improvements in the numbers as you adopt these changes. So I think those are some great things people can measure. Absolutely. On their own. And I think what's important also to highlight is that. Okay, so one of the biggest issues that I think people have is I have so many tools yep. that I have to use in order to get the data. Mm -hmm. What One thing that I really think is important is to have that data centralized and in graphic forms where you can actually visualize the trend change. You want to see that trend change. System like that, if some genius incredible. could do that, I think Jeez. we would be a trillionaire. I happen to know somebody. Yeah, so, one of the things I love about Heads Up Health, and this is a shameless plug, but I think it's important because you can take all this data, put it into your system, and basically have amazing data to look at and trend. So why don't you talk a little bit about yeah, that's how why you get I built it. it. Yeah, what is the, the benefit of Heads Up Health? So for those who are not familiar, Heads Up Health is a website that I developed myself, mm -hmm. and what it's intended to do is help you measure all this stuff yep. and have years and decades of metabolic history, all of your lab tests in one place, all of your heart rate variability, so that you can actually start to, as the individual, understand what changes work, what changes don't. Right. So for those who want to start tracking, all the stuff we've talked about here, everything integrates into one central website for you. And then it's not that hard. Once you have the information, you don't need to be a doctor or a biohacker or a rocket scientist to say, okay, I've got an inflammation number that needs yep. to go down. If I do the cold immersion, does inflammation go down? It's right. really grade school mathematics to start seeing if these Absolutely. changes work. But like you said, you just need a place to manage it all. So that's what I'm working on. That's my contribution at Heads Up Health. So easy way to quantify all this stuff and then share it with someone like right. yourself or any health expert yep. to say, am I doing this properly? Is my health improving? And what I think is really cool and what I'm excited about is getting to the point where you have so much data from people doing this to show correlation. So right now, you know, you can say, well, I think this causes this, but if you have you know, this huge range of data yep. showing, look, these people are doing cold water, water immersion for a certain period of time, these are what the markers have done. Yep. Then you start really generating real science yep. that we can use, take back and, and show physicians, medical practitioners, look, this stuff works. Yep. This is what we can show you. Now go out and do the real randomized controlled trials so that as physicians, we can say you should do this. But that's where I think a lot of the benefit is from. Absolutely, yeah. If we can give the average individual ways to say, yes, this is a very statistically significant right. improvement. And we've calculated that improvement for you, actually right. shown you the correlation curve. Exactly. And you have the evidence for yourself. Just by entering some simple data, the system can tell you that there's a very strong correlation mm -hmm. here. Take that back to your healthcare professional. And then, like you said, starting to do that at scale. Right. Now we can look at tens of thousands of people. That's where the information starts to get really powerful. Absolutely. I'm excited to see, you know, how this is going to protract going forward. So, all right, enough talk. I think, uh, should we jump in? I think it's time to jump in. No more, no more stalling. I can't hide anymore behind the camera. We're going to have to go jump in the water. Let's do it, brother. All right, let's do it. All right, we'll be back after we jump in the water. Hopefully. Hopefully.
All right, take some deep breaths. Feel the burn. What is this, 40? <laughs> 48 degrees. Let's see if you can put your arms in. Try to slow your breath. Try not to move too much. And then just kind of focus on your environment. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> Only one hour to go. Uh, why did I sign up for this? Just wait for it. It feels good eventually. You told me that I'm going to have lower blood pressure, lower <laughs> stress. You promised me, John Lemansky. Eventually. I'm holding you to this. Whew. I can't hear you. John said I'm going to be healthier, so I'm doing it. Ah. No, no. We're gonna go in for five minutes. You doing okay? Yep. Tell me how you're feeling. Uh, you know, it's getting better. Yep. It's like once you get to that initial, like, holy <laughs> shit. Yeah. Uh, it's getting better. I noticed the extremities are the hardest. The yep. hands are yep. actually the hardest yep. for me. You can put your arms in and leave your feet, hands out. Like that? Yep. Try to get low if you can to your neck. Because that's when you really get the vagus nerve inactive, yeah. or activated. Oh yeah, that so, just took it up another notch. <laughs> if you can get down as much as possible, you want to get the vagus nerve. In order to get yeah. the vagus nerve uh, activated, and the vagus nerve is your main par parasympathetic dominant system. Awesome. You Which gotta get your throat? neck. Yeah, you gotta get your neck at least up to your shoulders. And you'll notice, like we talked about the shivering. So right now I'm doing the shivering. You doing the shivering? No. <laughs> Starting to get there. <laughs> Stop peeing in the water. <laughs> I'm creating a warm spot. It's a hack, man. I thought yeah. this was a biohacking segment. Are you sure this is The you... urine spot does not count. That's cheating for the record, okay? When I, growing up, I used to surf a lot and would use wetsuits, and the best feeling was peeing in your wetsuit. Unfortunately, here, it's too cold. I can't even do that. So anyways, I'm, I'm getting the shivering right now. So that's the heat generation we talked about. Yeah. Eventually that'll go away and we'll get that brown adipose tissue activated. All right, I'm fully submerged to the neck. You're doing good, man. First time, look at you. Impressive. You're a natural, man. See, it's not that bad. Well, it probably feels good once you get out and you probably want yeah. to go back in. No. <laughs> no? no. You You're done? You do not want to go back in. Let's put it that way. But you'll feel You'll feel fantastic once you warm up. Well, we took some measurements before we came mm -hmm. in, so we'll share the numbers. Yep. But we measured heart rate, yep. heart rate variability, blood pressure, and glucose, glucose, ketones. Yep. So we're, we're actually going to try to quantify this stuff. Yep. So that we can yeah, properly you, test it. Now we can't measure norepinephrine no. and some of the other pathways and the things that you mentioned nope. during the video that you'd need expensive lab equipment for. Correct. But there is data we can collect at home, yep. and we did some of that. So, so indirect inferences of, you know, sympathetic tone. So, you can look at heart rate, resting heart rate, so especially tomorrow morning. Yeah. You can look at your sleep pattern tonight. Yeah. Or ring. Or ring. Yeah. You can look at HRV once your core temperature warms up. Yeah. Because you might not read. Yeah. Um, you can look at glucose. Yeah. What'll be interesting is you'll see your glucose probably go down. Well, let's check when we get out. We I'm curious because we tested before we went in. Yep. You guys are at about four minutes. Cool. Oh, I'm feeling good, man. Yeah. I, I feel pretty good. You guys having some shrinkage? <laughs> way Testicles past that point. Testicles are way up inside. Way past that point. Yeah. I have a new Adam's apple. Yeah. <laughs> ah. Look around there, man. Turn around. Look at that. If you're going to do it, this is the place to do it. Oh, yeah. Are you guys stressed? So stressed, man. It's not easy. Are you stressed? It's really not easy. <laughs> I don't recommend this. Tahoe sucks. Tahoe is amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Tahoe. Warning, cold immersion. It sucks. Oh. Now, here's what you do. We're good. Yeah. All right. Five minutes. We did it. We did it. Congratulations. All right, guys. That's five minutes. That's enough for right now. Thank you. Whoo. Let's warm up. All right, call the paramedics. <laughs> All righty. Uh. Woo! Yeah. Uh. Can you do like a bird?